today on Real Life, discovering your God-given courage and strength. Author Marilyn Chadwick reveals how you can become a woman of valor. Also on Dashing Dish, dinner in minutes. Katie Farrell throws together a quick meal for when you are on the go. And on Real Life Coaching, Dr. William J. Federer explains how printing the Bible forever changed the world. That's today on Real Life. This is real life. God loves you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit, he empowers you. And the Bible is your and my guide to abundant life. That's the kind of life we're looking for, Terry, is That's abundant right. life. Abundant life. Full of God's blessing and full of God's purpose. That's right. You know, it's like you almost want to shout it. Do you want to shout? Yeah, shout. What? Uh. Nah. <laughs> abundant life. How's that? <laughs> this is my beautiful wife, Terry, co-host, and our pastor co-host, Jay Anthony Gilbert. All right. We're glad to be together. That's to right. We're all, and you know what? It's getting into May. We have to tell you that we have, our youngest son is home from college. Yes, he We've is. brought him home, and he's just getting himself acclimated, and we also celebrated our older son graduating from college. Whoa, yes. three. Got to bring pictures in the show. I know, we'll do pictures. that. We have three that have finished college, three out of four. We're, we're heading towards a new season here. And guess what? Yes. I got two getting ready to start daycare. <laughs> so we're moving along. Everybody we're going to stretch your hand out towards you. <laughs> Stretch out of faith. I'll take all the show. prayers you can give me. Trust me. No, those are good seasons. That's a they great are season. Seasons. New we, sometimes yeah. I wish I was back in your season. Oh no. Oh. You know? Really? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> for just a little bit. Sometimes. <laughs> but then other times I'm thankful for where we are. Oh, amen. amen. Well, and you know, also this is a great time for us to bring up gardening. Okay, <laughs> you know this is getting around the time that we all start planting. I've had some folks ask me, oh, no, now, when I, do you start planting? You. And I'm like, I wait until Memorial Day around here because you never know about this onion snow, which last year you questioned me about it, but it's a true thing. <laughs> it is a true thing. The last kind of thing, I've never snow seen before it happens. From the sky. <laughs> no, it's, you know, but Dawn's going into gardening this year. I am. I, Isn't that I, awesome? I have a straw. Yeah garden bale. I showed okay. you guys one right. time. I'm going to come back. I'll, I, when I plant, and I plan on planting this weekend, my, my starters in my garden bale. It literally is a bale of straw. It is. And we're going to see what it grows out of that thing. Organic. Now, listen, this is organic. No pesticides. None of that stuff that you <laughs> <laughs> keep the bugs away. I, I welcome all bugs. To he my, welcomes all to, bugs. To Except dogs. Bale. One of our dogs likes to jump up on the bale. We don't know why she does that. Why don't you go onto our Facebook, yes. onto our Facebook page, uh, Cornerstone TV on Facebook, and, and post some pictures of your garden. That'd or your plants. Awesome. Maybe you don't have a garden, but maybe you have a plant. You know, that little plant that you care for and love and take care of. Share share the yes. plant with us. Well, you know, uh, last year I tried to grow loofah. I'm not growing loofah oh. this year. It, I met with the loofah farmer in Tennessee, and he just <laughs> told me that Pennsylvania doesn't have the best kind of climate. But I'm going to try to grow those little squash. You know, they look like um, outer space. Is that that pity pan stuff Yeah. Oh, that's right. Good memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I like to try new kind of uh, veggies. So if you have something that's unusual, let me know so we can grow it. Welcome to Real Life Farmer's <laughs> Almanac. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we, we learn real answers for real, real life. life. Real that's really what we're about is mm -hmm. bringing the Word of God alive. We want to know what the Word says and how it impacts our lives, Pastor. That's mm -hmm. what this, this program is meant to, to do is, is to dig into the Word mm -hmm. and find its truth and then see it applied in our lives. Amen. That's what's so awesome. I'm so glad that you tuned in because there's always something fresh something that God is going to send right from heaven, right to your life today. And so be ready, anticipate, and put your expectors up and get ready to receive God's blessing for you your know, life today. How true that is. And what Jay just said is so important for you. Listen, listen to clo closely to what he said. We have to put faith out. 
So you're just not watching a television program, and we're certainly glad that you've tuned in. But this isn't a television program. Obviously, by watching for a minute, you've discovered that that's the case. What we are is we are asking the Holy Spirit Amen. to be uh, use us as a vessel to flow through us and through the technology and then into your home and or to where you are into your computer or into your smartphone and to, to, to engage with us on a spiritual level. Amen. On a spiritual level, you know, we can't really entertain you. We can't compete in the entertainment world. But what we're here to do is say, God has a message for you. He wants you to hear his voice. He wants to take you along the path that he has designed for you to walk, Pastor Jay. And that path leads to greatness. I believe we have greatness inside of us. Amen. You know, you said something really good about entertainment. Entertainment is the devil's replacement for God's joy. But this place brings you joy through the word of God so you can have the abundant life. That's good, brother. Entertainment can never replace inspiration. Amen. Because, you know, or that you want inspiration. Entertainment's gone. Gone, gone, gone. What's the next thing? Inspiration builds. It builds Amen. life, Terry. It's life giving. So welcome to real life where we believe the Lord's going to touch you by his spirit right now in this Amen. program. And in our coaching coming up, we're going to talk about how the Reformation. Now, this is very interesting for those who like history. See, because God's all the way through the thread through history, how he used Reformation to impact Christianity and then ultimately the world when we come back for our coaching. So don't go away. We got the dashing dishes in the house. She's going to cook something good. I know. She always does. And it's I what I love about dashing dish is that Katie always tries to provide us with a great recipe that's quick and an easy cleanup. Plus, it's delicious. And today, she is making for us a quick orange chicken. Let's take a look. I'm Katie with Dashing Dish, and at Dashing Dish, I'm all about teaching you how to create healthy alternatives to the food you crave. And a lot of times people tell me one of the things that they really crave, and it's hard to give up when it comes to living a healthy lifestyle, is takeout. So whether it be Asian or Mexican, you know, you think there's nothing better than driving through the drive-thru and picking a quick takeout and bringing it home and enjoying it. Well, I'm going to show you that you can make it at home in just about 15 minutes. And today I'm going to do an Asian inspired dish. It's 15 minute Asian orange chicken. So I have some chicken, just one pound of chicken breast cooking in a pan here. And I have it just over medium heat. And you see how it's kind of getting white there. So it's starting to cook on one side. And I pre-diced it just to make the cooking process a little bit quicker. And it helps it cook more evenly as well. So I started that off in the pan, just cooking it a little bit, and I'm gonna make a sauce to go with this. The sauce is really simple. Again, this is 15 minutes, so it's very simple. We're gonna do one tablespoon of rice wine vinegar. I'm gonna take that cap off. So rice wine vinegar is great in Asian dishes. It gives it kind of that tangy flavor. One tablespoon of soy sauce. and then half a teaspoon of ground ginger. It's very powerful, so you don't wanna to use too much, just a half teaspoon. Two tablespoons of tomato paste. You could also do ketchup if you have an organic or low sugar ketchup option. Just add this all to a bowl. And then the juice of one orange. So this is what makes it orange chicken. And you know, a lot of times I think that people think, I just don't have time to cook. That's why I grab takeout. It's just easier. I don't have to think about anything. But all of these ingredients you can have right in your pantry. Really all you need for this recipe is a can of tomato paste, an orange, and then some chicken. And the rest of these things generally are found just in our pantry. So the juice of one orange. If you like it a little bit more of that orange flavor, you could do it the zest of the orange as well. And then one tablespoon of garlic. You could do garlic powder, but I like the fresh garlic for this recipe. And stir that up. And then to make this sauce a little bit um, thicker, I'm gonna use some cornstarch. I'm gonna give my chicken a quick stir here. So you can see that the sauce is a little bit runny, a little bit liquidy. So 
So we're gonna thicken it up with just a cornstarch mixture. And all I did for this was I did one tablespoon of cornstarch with one tablespoon of cold water. I mixed it in and that way it dissolves the cornstarch. If you're opposed to using cornstarch, you can always use arrowroot powder as well. It thickens any sauce. So I'm gonna add that to our sauce mixture. Get it all in there. And the reason I um, add water to the cornstarch ahead of time is just so that it dissolves because it kind of gets sticky and clumpy otherwise. So it's important to do that. And then I'm gonna give this sauce a good whisk. Doesn't look like much yet, but when we add it to our chicken, you'll see how it really thickens up nicely. You could also do red pepper flakes to this. You could top it with a little cilantro. So really um, just bring out those Asian flavors. So I'm gonna add that to the chicken. And you can see the chicken is almost cooked through. We have a little bit of pink left and that's when you wanna add the sauce. Just at the end there. And then kind of stir it in and you'll see that it starts to kind of thicken up real quickly. And you'll wanna let this cook the rest of the way through the chicken. So it just needs maybe about two more minutes, not even, maybe another minute. And I'm gonna just go ahead and finish off the rest of those oranges just right into the pan, just to get all the juice in there. And then I like to top this with, like I said, you could do cilantro if you like cilantro, but I like to top it with some sesame seeds. And then I like to serve it with a side of quinoa or um, steamed broccoli. So it really gives it that Asian, inspired flavor. You get the full meal. And you know, really, it's not about, when you're trying to eat healthy, it's not about cutting things out completely and saying, oh, I can't have Asian food anymore. I just need to have a salad and a chicken breast because that's what's healthy. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but really it's about taking your favorite dishes and putting a healthy spin on them, um, making it at home. I would say if you can cook at home, even 80% of the time, you'll be so much better off when it comes to your health and your nutrition. Because a lot of times food from restaurants is where it adds a lot of salt, a lot of oil and butter in places that really, it doesn't even need to be added. So making it from home is so much better for you. And you save money. And like I said, this took 15 minutes, so we saved some time too. Because I would say by the time you make it through the um, you know, takeout, you're definitely gonna be at at least 15 minutes. So I'm gonna bring my plate over here and just scoop a little on there. And again, I would serve this with a side of quinoa, but you could do whole grain rice, some steamed broccoli. Look how good that looks. And the tomato paste gave it kind of that nice, rich, orangey color. And then we're gonna top it with a little bit of sesame seeds. And there you go, it looks just like traditional orange chicken. So I hope that this recipe was helpful for you today and gave you a creative idea rather than just zipping through the takeout. Um, for the more recipes just like this, head over to ctvn.org. Cornerstone family, Terry and I want to personally invite you to join us this October in Israel. This is going to be a trip unlike any tour to Israel. We're keeping it small so that we have personal time together as we worship, fellowship, and explore. Our focus is gonna be on the prophetic, past, present, and what is yet to be fulfilled. Israel is where God's word comes alive. Space is limited, so call today or go online to get all the details. Going to Israel is a life-changing experience. To make it as affordable as possible, We've kept the price under $4,000. We would be honored for you to join us as we visit Israel, the land of prophetic promise.
love encouraging women to be women of valor mm -hmm. that God has made us to be. Marilyn Chadwick is helping women discover the courage and strength that God has given us. She brings her message in the book, Woman of Valor. Marilyn, welcome to Real Life. Thank you. It's so good to be here, and I'm so glad you love the Woman of Valor as much as I do. Oh, you yes. Know, and when we saw that you were, uh, your book title, when we saw on the schedule you were coming, I thought, this is really a God thing. It is a God thing. And when I saw that you had done a whole week's worth of shows on Woman of Valor, I was like, we're going to be friends, right? I know. I yeah. know. I thought, oh, my goodness. I yeah. loved your book. Thank you. It, it's just... Um, it I actually loved some... writing it because I felt like I got to know the Women of Valor right. of the Bible. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it was really critical about, I thought it was helpful in giving tips. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, I don't want to spoil it, but let's start with our tradition. <laughs> we have to start with our, we, you're new to our family. Yes. First time here? First time ever. First time, I think, in, Pins in Pittsburgh, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, we yeah. welcome you. And you know what Thank we you. ask you is kind of an initiation of telling us about yourself and your family, okay. a little bit about your, your husband and yeah. children. And yeah. Where are you from? So people get to know a little bit about you. Well, you don't have to listen to me long when I say y'all to know I'm from the Deep <laughs> South. Uh, grew up in my early years in Atlanta, and okay. then my daddy was transferred and whatnot, and, and you know we moved around the Deep South. But I, by the time I was age 15, had walked away from God, right? I was not going to become a believer, not going to marry a minister of all things. I even said that to myself. I'm not going to ever become a Christian, and I would surely never marry a minister. So of course, I became a believer at age 21. Then I met my husband on a blind date and we got married and it took because we are celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary in a week. Awesome. Yes. Congratulations. And 38 of those years at the same, serving the same church. Wow. So he is a pastor. He is a pastor <laughs> and I'm a pastor's wife and I am certainly a believer, uh, happily so, but I'm an unlikely person to be doing this. I'm an unlikely person to have written that book. And I just always say, God's plans were way better for me than mine were for myself. Well, share with us, how did this all begin, your history in that? You know, I almost have to say it was a long pilgrimage, even from the time, part of the reason I walked away from the Lord at 15, there are lots of reasons, but one is I wanted to do my own thing, and I thought that had to be world-changing and, and exciting, and I had no idea that was actually folded into the pages of Scripture. So fast forward, became a believer, had kind of struggled with what does it look like to really be God's woman, and I didn't like some of the extremes on either side, mm -hmm. and so I've always kind of been one that wanted to gravitate toward middle ground and find the truth, you know, that's really there that's in God's Word. David and I were writing books on marriage. We were writing books on how to honor, he wrote one, how to honor your wife, I wrote one, how to honor your husband. And in my study, I happened to look at Proverbs 31.10, you know, that often studied verse about the virtuous woman. And when I looked at all the different Bible translations and I got to the Orthodox Jewish Bible and it called her a woman of valor, mm -hmm. I was like stunned. I was captivated. I was like, why hasn't anybody ever told me this? Mm -hmm. So of course, being a little study freak that I am, I'm kind of a bookworm. I went back and found out everything I could on this woman, looked at the pages of scripture at other women of valor in the Bible. And then of course, with our travels, our church has grown a lot. So we've been all over the world with the missions work that we supported. I just had these fantastic stories of women, women of valor that I felt like had to be told. Mm -hmm. So that's what really gave birth to the book. Now, how do you define that? Because I know how Terry defines it, but yeah. I want to hear your... Well, you know, the Hebrew, and it's pronounced differently depending on who you talk to, but if you're talking to a good Hebrew speaker, it's eshet hayel, you know, the, the C-H is an H. And hayel in the Bible is valor, and it's basically courage under fire. Um, it's often used to describe God when he helps his people, King David's mighty men of valor. Um, it's not just courage and bravery, but it involves things like self-sacrifice and honor, even wealth. And so you put eshet, which is woman of hail, valor, woman of valor is God's woman. I think she's part nurturer because we are, mm -hmm. but she's also part warrior. And that is what I feel like sort of got left out in some of the more modern translations. So it's a very courageous term. Mm. Very courageous. Sounds like a woman of action. Yeah, well, a woman of action. I, I think so. And I, I think, too, when you talked about woman of valor, share one of the stories of the rag picker's wife. Yeah, I the think rag picker's was. wife. Well, you know, I think in our day and age, we have sort of 
left that strong nurturing role in some of the dust of our ambitions, okay? Mm -hmm. So I need to say that, I, I, need to, I need to say, I think the feminist movement, for some of the good things that it did, left nurture and self-sacrifice in the dust, Christian and otherwise. And when I was in India a couple of years ago, we went all over seeing some of the great work being done by the evangelists there, but there was one in particular, and he was a rag picker. His name was Raju. It's a very common name in India. And he had church in his little tent next to the dump because where he picked his rags was in the dump. So there's this tent and we are in there and that is church. And his beautiful wife, who was the mother of his six children, was the most stunning woman I think I met on my entire trip there. She had turned this little tiny tent into their home, into their kitchen, into the bedroom, into church. That's where we met for church. But she had nurtured those children. I'll tell you, if I showed you pictures of her sons and daughters, you would have thought that they had a great feast every night for food because they were well nurtured. You would have thought they had great educational opportunities because their faces were shining. Um, but you look at the mother and she was thin and worn, even though beautiful, because if they didn't have enough to eat, guess who she gave the food to? Mm -hmm. To the children. Mm -hmm. And so she was a warrior, yes, because she was fighting for their dreams. She was also the nurturer. And as I left that tent that day, I will never forget the rag picker's wife as an example to me of a true woman of valor, right. part nurturer, mm -hmm. part warrior, and giving her life for her next generation. Absolutely. That, that was really... That really, when I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, what an example of a woman of valor she was. And I can was. still see her, you know, mm -hmm. when something makes that much of an impact on you. Oh, I can yes. still see her and I can still see her little tent. Marilyn, how does a, a lady who's not been really active and believes in the Lord and has uh, maybe gone further down in their life, how do they change? Can, can somebody become a woman of valor yeah. no matter how old they are? You know, Don, I think that's probably one of the most important questions that we can talk about today. Because in the Bible, women of valor range in ages from Esther as a teenager to Deborah, and we don't know how old. And I think a woman of valor is any age or stage in life because God needs all of his women, right? Mm -hmm. To be pouring life into those around them. When I travel in Africa, they will always call me mother. Did you know that every woman in Africa, and this was especially true in Rwanda, every woman is called a mother because she pours life into the next generation. So whatever the woman is out there, maybe that's kind of veered off this, I would think her first step might be to say, Lord, I'm just gonna pray that you'll break my heart for what breaks yours. Mm -hmm. This is kind of how my journey started, you know, of looking outside my walls. Break my heart for what breaks yours and then start to watch and see who he leads you to. It might be your next door neighbor. It might be a child in the classroom or Sunday school class that you teach. Mm -hmm. It might be somebody within your own family. But I think if you're sincerely asking the Lord to show you how to be a woman of valor, I think he's a man of his word. He's a God of his word and he'll open that door. And so we need to be willing and to say, God, break my heart for mm -hmm. what breaks yours. And don't be surprised mm -hmm. at what he does. You know, sometimes he takes us out of our comfort zones. Right. Like me, I'll never be a Christian. I'll never marry a minister. I also say I'll never go to Africa. And I won't even tell you what all the other things I said. <laughs> but I don't even say that anymore. My kids laugh at me because they say, Mom, if you say you're not going to do it, what's so funny is God will open the door and I'll love it. But your women out there, I bet you some of them know deep down inside they long to be world changers. Sure. And it all starts sure. with prayer. Sure. Actually, it starts with abiding in Christ. Mm -hmm. It starts with abiding. And then the Holy Spirit issues the call. And that's something that you mentioned too as well, that abiding in Christ, that we need to take mm -hmm. care of ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, because what can we do if we are empty? That's you right. know, we need to make sure we take the time to read God's word and to abide that's and right. to pray. And even our physical temple. So mm -hmm. many women get so spiritually minded and they may be praying all day, but their bodies have been a wreck. And I don't mean for women to go overboard, but just a balanced approach to temple. I call it temple upkeep. Because mm -hmm. if we really want to be used by God, we have to be attentive to all those things. Absolutely. You know, as, as the guy in the conversation about yeah, yeah. women of valor, we'll kind, let of, you a, in, kind right? of an oddball, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, the third wheel in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. As an observation, my observation is ladies, mothers, especially mothers who have had uh, the privilege of raising their mm -hmm. children, those, those ch child raising years is all, in, they just take everything. They take everything. Mm -hmm. But after the kids have grown mm -hmm. or start to become independent, mm -hmm. there seems to be a gap. Mm -hmm. This is the dad man looking in. Yeah. And I think if that's the perfect time, 
In the men's world, they call it halftime. You know, there's yeah, this whole ministry right, of halftime. Half but that's the perfect time, I think, for a lady to say, I need to shift mm -hmm. into being active and become a woman of valor yeah. for the ministry that exactly. God's called me into. That's right. Now, the, being a parent, being a mom, is certainly a ministry. Yeah that the Lord has called you into. Yeah, sure. but, the, but the shift of that, yeah. and I think that, I don't know if you see that in your, in your ministry with women, Absolutely. is there a time when focus can change? Well, and my, I was really consumed with the children. And, and remember, I had kind of been the feminist before I became a believer. I don't know how much I stressed that, but I was really going in this direction. So when I became a believer and then I had my children, I really wanted to pour life into them. So I was there. Mm -hmm. But uh, that shift began as they started kind of getting more independent and leaving the nest. And I'm glad I was mindful to that because if you aren't, I think you get swept into maybe just lazy living. And so I think if you have this on your radar screen, maybe start to dabble in some areas where you can use your gifts even while your children are there. I did some things and I would serve with them. I would take them with me when I would go into the inner city or whatever. Well, the book is Woman of Valor. Come to our website so you can see how you can get a copy for yourself. We're going to go see what Sydney's found in the news. Then I'm going to get Pastor Jay over here because he's a, he's a dad with young children. So we'll be right back. A dispute over church grants is heading to the Supreme Court. A New Jersey county wants the court to overturn a ruling that bars the practice of giving public historic preservation grants to houses of worship. Last month, a New Jersey Supreme Court ruled the county's policy violates the state constitution. The judge says excluding churches from grants is like withholding general benefits of people based on their spiritual beliefs. And one of the oldest churches in America celebrated a big milestone. Martin Brando Episcopal Church in Virginia turned 400 years old. According to historical documents, the church had a log building and minister by 1618. Many families in the congregation say the church has been a part of their history for a very long time. Well, that's all for God in the Headlines. Have a great day on Purpose. Well, we're here with Jay, and we were just saying, Jay, you married a woman of valor. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've been so blessed. The Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Absolutely. Lord. So a favorous man will find a valorous woman. That's right. Do you know that the woman of valor, that the valor is likened to David's mighty men. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a pretty good mm -hmm. thing. It's a military term, mm -hmm. which you kind of need to be in the military if you're raising boys, right? Or you're <laughs> you, know, two you need yeah. to be able to. Sergeant I had two boys yeah. too. That's right. <laughs> yes, yeah. ma'am. Yeah. Right. I had girl, boy, boy, but I, I raised the babysitter, and then I she helped me take care of the babies. <laughs> but I had two. My, my sons now are six nine and six seven. So oh, wow. you know, I had to be kind of tough. Yeah. Right? Sure, sure, yeah. sure. That's right. Now, see, when you have young children, your wife is all in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know she is. I'm not, I don't live with you, but I tell you, oh, yeah. your wife is all in. And Tiff has a call in her life and she's, a, she's greatly skilled, but she set that aside mm -hmm. like Terry did, set mm -hmm. that aside. And as you did, did for a season yeah. to be the mom, but there's a season coming for her. And mm -hmm. I think Terry's there and you've been there mm -hmm. where now you can shift back in yeah to that next place. That next place. Mm -hmm. And this, I think mm -hmm. this is that next place where right. you can rediscover what God's call is mm -hmm. and his anointing is for you to, for the outreach because the family is the inreach. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Then the outreach can, yeah. can begin. Does that make sense to you? I think that's you? a great way of putting it. And, and, and it's sometimes helpful for women to keep that, the mindfulness about that while they're raising their children because they can take in little bits and pieces. I'm sure right. you did that. You don't mm -hmm. totally lose your outward focus, but it's nice to bring the children along with you. But yeah, I, I kind of, like the minute I hit 50, is kind of, I started, you know, I think my first book didn't come out. This is my third one. I didn't even write books. My daughter was saying the other day, Mama, I, I can't believe you didn't write any books while we were growing up. <laughs> so, well, we're like, thankful for yeah. this <laughs> book. Marilyn, thank you for writing this. Mm -hmm. Go to our website, find out where you can get a copy. We're coming up with Dr. Bill Federer, my favorite historian, as we talk about the the Revolutionary War and pre-Revolutionary War time period. You don't want to go anywhere because there's a lot by looking backwards, as we just talked about, to takes us forward so we can learn from our history about what God did then, what he's going to do in the future. He's a God of faithfulness. He's a God of truth. So you don't want to go anywhere. We're going to come right back for Real Life Coaching. Now more than ever, it's important to stay connected. Here at Cornerstone, we want you to be in the loop. Call now for Real Life Today, the free newsletter that will keep you up to date on all of our programs and specials. It has encouraging articles and behind the scenes stories. 
Real Life Today, the little newsletter that packs a giant punch. Call now. Interested in a product featured on today's Real Life? Now you can find all of your favorite books, CDs, DVDs, gifts, and more. All in one place at ctvn.org backslash shop. Real Answers for Real Life, now delivered right to your mailbox. Welcome to Real Life Coaching. It's our goal to help you become the very best you possible. And then when you're that best you possible to win in life God's way. Yes, you can win in life. God wants you to win in life. He's made you more than a conqueror. He's put his Holy Spirit in you. That's what real life coaching is all about. Dr. Bill Federer, he continues his coaching session on the treacherous world of the 16th century. Today, he reveals how God used the Reformation to change the world. Let's get ready for coaching. You know, the, appreciate you being with us as a coach, first of all. It's, it's fascinating to me, and I, I, know, I know it's fascinating to our, to our partners and viewers. But when you think about Europe and the control that the church had on government and on Christianity and very strong control, that makes the Reformation, what we call the Reformation. Well, first of all, how, how do you define Reformation? How did that impact Europe and Christianity? Well, it act impacted Europe tremendously and it was also a change in government from the top down to the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell people sort of interesting, um, if somebody becomes a Christian and then a year later somebody else becomes a new Christian, the new Christian has a question. He goes to the older Christian and says, what should I do? The older Christian has a response. He either says, oh, that's easy, you do this. Mm -hmm. Or he can say, well, let's sit down and look at the Bible. Let's read, let's pray, let's talk to some other people that, that know the Bible. And, and um, But if he says, do this or do that, then the next question the new one has, he says, I'll, I'll just ask Joe. Then he has another one, another one. And, then, and, and you multiply that by a couple thousand years and you got the clergy and the laity. You got these people that know everything and then the other bodies, they just sit back and say, well, the other one does the ministry. And one group gets prideful because they're the, the ones that know a little more and the other one gets lazy. And so the right way is, no, you need to develop your own relationship with God. But, uh, but the Reformation was a movement back in the direction of that the individual has to have faith. You know, there's a concept called deconstruction where you separate people from their past, get them into a neutral where they don't remember where they came from, and then you brainwash them into a future, you have a plan for them. And uh, it's a sales technique. So if I was a toothpaste salesman, the first thing I would do is say negative things about the toothpaste you're currently using. You're still using that old stuff. Don't you know it'll eat the enamel off your teeth? Ooh, you're repulsed by it. Now I got you into a neutral. You're open-minded. What are all the toothpaste out there? And then I give you my pitch for this brand new tartar control breath freshener stuff. And so they go into the classrooms and they tell the kids negative things about the founding fathers. They owned slaves, took land from Indians, and knew the students are repulsed by them. Now you got the kids into a neutral. They're open-minded. What are all the belief systems out there? Then you can give them your pitch for LGBT or socialism or Islam. And we see Europe went through this. Europe went from a Judeo-Christian Europe with Catholic cathedrals, Protestant Reformation, Jewish neighborhoods. Then it went into a secular neutral Europe with the French Revolution and it's free sex, anything goes. Now it's entering an Islamic Europe with Mohammed being the number one name for newborns in Brussels and Milan and Germany. And so we need to understand that everything is moving one way or the other and history helps us to gain a perspective. So the Reformation was a big turning point. And so a little background, um, the uh, uh, early church was persecuted for three centuries and then Constantine ends the persecution and then the whole Roman Empire becomes Christian. And then it begins to be attacked by Attila the Hun, they survive, uh, and then it's attacked by Islam. So Muhammad was born in 570 AD and uh, he starts his faith in 610 AD and he transitions from being a religious leader to a political leader to a military leader. And so he dies in 632 AD. 
and the rightly guided caliphs and the sultans are generals. And they conquer Yemen, which used to be a Jewish kingdom. They conquer Egypt, which used to be completely Christian, evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, until Amir ibn Alas conquers it. Then they conquer Syria, which was completely Christian, evangelized by Paul. The name Christian was first used in Syria until Caliph Umar conquered it. And then there used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa in the seventh century. Uh, they had embraced this thing called pietism where if you really become a Christian, you were expected to give away your money and live in a cave or join a monastery. And it was this withdrawal from society. As a result, Islam just swept through North Africa. And then in the year 711, they invaded Spain. They're on horses, Arabian horses with stirrups and scimitar swords. Europeans are still on foot. So in 10 years, the Muslims conquer all of Spain, carry away over a million into slavery. There were whole Catholic orders in Europe called the Trinitarians and the head of the order was called the Ransomer and they'd try to get your friend back. And then the Muslims crossed the Pyrenees Mountains and they're finally stopped outside of Paris at the Battle of Tours in 732 AD, just 100 years after the death of Mohammed in 632 AD. They go from Arabia to Paris in a 100 year military campaign. And since this is the first century of Islam, there are some that look to that as their example, the way Christians look to the first century of Christianity as our example. But then the Turks convert to Islam and they conquer into what is today Turkey. And so all seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by Muslim Turks. And the letters in the New Testament to Ephesus and Colossae and Galatia and Philippi, all those cities were wiped out by Muslim Turks. The Greek Christians begged the West for help. The West sends help, it's called the Crusades. When they end, the Muslims pick up with their Crusades and they conquer Constantinople in 1453. This ends the land trade routes to get from Europe over to India and China the year 1453, right? Well, what happened a little later is the Europeans were looking for a sea route. And in 1492, Columbus set sail. Columbus would have never set sail looking for a sea route to get to India and China had the Muslims not conquered Constantinople 40 years earlier, cutting off the land routes. Well, then the Muslims uh, surround uh, and invade Greece. And all the Greek scholars are fleeing west with their Greek New Testaments and their Greek art and architecture and literature. This flood of Greek stuff into Florence, Italy, we call the Renaissance. And uh, then the Greek scholars flee with their Greek New Testaments. And so now the Western scholars can translate the Bible, not just to Latin, but all the way back to Greek. And this reinterest in the original language of the New Testament lays the foundation for the Reformation. So in 1517, Martin Luther starts the Reformation. In 1529, 100,000 Muslims surround Vienna, Austria, and so the Holy Roman Emperor, the most powerful guy in Europe is Charles V of Spain. He's faced with a double dilemma, Protestant Reformation on one hand, Muslim invasion on the other. And so he strikes a deal with these Protestant kings and he lets every king decide what's gonna be believed in his kingdom. And so they stop the Islamic invasion, but in the next century, different kings believe different things. And so England became Anglican, Scotland Presbyterian, Holland Dutch Reformed, Sweden and Northern Germany were Lutheran, Switzerland, Calvinist, and Italy, Spain, France, Austria, Poland remained Catholic. But it was whatever the king believed, the kingdom had to believe. And if not, you were persecuted, you fled. So suddenly Europe is thrown into this mass migration, people shifting from one country to another. They spill over and found colonies in America. Well, we focus in a little bit more on England. So there was a Catholic king named Henry VIII. And uh, he's married to Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, who sent Columbus to America. And after 18 years, Catherine does not have a son. He, he, she has a daughter, Mary, Bloody Mary, but not a son. So Henry decides to divorce her. The Pope will not recognize the divorce. So Henry decides to make himself his own Pope. He starts the Church of England, puts himself on as the head, goes on to have six wives. Not a really nice guy to be married to. Well, let's back up. So. Henry VIII, when he was Catholic, he had William Tyndall burnt at the stake for translating the Bible into English. And William Tyndall's last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. So three years later, as he decides to divorce his wife and his advisors say, if you really want to break with Rome, you, you need to stop using the Latin Bible, get an English Bible. Those German princes have it in German that helped them break away. You need an English. And so he they basically take William Tyndall's work and re redo it, call it the Great Bible, and they spread it around England. But something unexpected happened. People began to read it and began to compare what's in this Bible to this king divorcing and beheading his wives. And so a group starts that wants to purify the Church of England. They're nicknamed the Puritans. So the attitude was, yes, you can read the Bible in your own language. No, you can't believe whatever you want. 
<laughs> and the king passes the act of uniformity. And so this was the government deciding what everybody in the country had to believe. We're beginning to see a little of that today with maybe the LGBT or transgendered and these different ones saying, hey, we're the approved government belief system. And if you don't go along with us, the government's going to come in and sue you and shut down your bakery and your, your businesses or whatever. And so this is what was happening in England. You had to believe exactly the way that the government and the king said. The Puritans tried to purify the church and then the separatists fled. They fled to Holland, they fled to America, and we call them the pilgrims. And so the Reformation began this impact across Europe, not just of uh, religion, but also in government strategy. Uh, what do I mean? Uh, the whole world was ruled from top down by kings. And, and the church had the same similar model, a hierarchical structure. And Martin Luther's idea was, no, the, the individual people can read the Bible. And this began to influence the governments and the idea that, hey, the government is where God gives rights and freedoms to each individual citizen. And then the citizens are all equal and they choose from amongst their equals on who's going to fix the potholes in the roads and who's going to do this. They divide up responsibilities amongst equals. And so this changes from the, the divine right of kings model. So the pilgrims come across to America. They were going to land in Jamestown, which was a king-controlled colony, and they get blown off course 500 miles. They try going south of Cape Cod, but it's what they call the, um, the graveyard of ships. 3,000 ships have sunk on that area. And so the, um, uh, the captain of the Mayflower almost sinks, but he goes back to Plymouth and says, okay, everybody, off the boat. And, uh, and so they um, uh, get off, but they have a question. Who's going to be in charge of us? There's no king appointed person in our group. We're all going to go to Jamestown and now it's an emergency. They do something unique. They give themselves the authority and it's called the Mayflower Compact. We in the presence of God covenant ourselves together to form a civil body politic. We agree to pass laws that are necessary and we will yield submission to these laws. Simple revolutionary. This was this re reformation model, this covenant where they're all equals, they're covenanted together under God. They choose from amongst their equals. They basically took their congregational form of church government and made it their government government. And so that became a model for the other New England colonies and eventually the U.S. Constitution. Uh, I want to uh, put in one thought here regarding the calendar. A little trivia. So Europe had been using the Julian calendar. It goes back to Julius Caesar, and it was this idea that um, the beginning of the year was March 1st, but he moved it to January 1st. And we know that because September originally was the seventh month. Sept is Latin for seven. October was the eighth month, like octagon, eight-sided, right? November, nove is Latin for nine. And December, decimal is Latin for 10. And Julius Caesar moves the beginning of the year from March 1st to January 1st. He names the old fifth month after himself. It used to be Quintilius, now it's July. And uh, it only had 30 days, so he took a day from the old end of the year, February, added it to July. And then uh, Augustus Caesar did the same thing, named a month after himself to August, and took a day, added it from February to August. That's why July and August have 31, and um, uh, February has 28. Anyway, this Julian calendar has a leap year every four years, but it's 11 minutes off. And so by the 1500s, you're 10 days off. So there's a pope named Pope Gregory, and he has the Gregorian calendar where he says, okay, we're going to uh, skip the leap year every year divisible by 100 unless it's also divisible by 400. A little complicated, but it's so accurate, we're still using it today. Now, why is this important? Because for the next century and a half, the Protestant countries have refused to use it. And so you had two dating systems going on in Europe. Uh, the Catholic countries using the more accurate Gregorian calendar and the Protestant countries using the old Julian calendar. And so you see the pilgrims land in America on November 12th, but also you'll read where they landed November 20th. Well, if you look close, one says uh, NS for new style, the other says OS for old style. And so uh, this is important when you're reading these ancient documents to uh, just figure the discrepancies between them. But anyway, the pilgrims did come to America and they did bring the idea of a government from the bottom up and that idea is traced all the way back to the Reformation. They came, they came in search of what, Bill? What, what did they come here for? They came for religious freedom, right? So they were separatists and they were having home churches in England and the king was arresting them and bringing them before the star chamber 
where they would cut off your ear or cut your nose in half or brand you on the face as a heretic with the letters SL for seditious liable. Mm -hmm. And so it was a serious, it was considered treason if you did not believe exactly the way the king did. And so the, we see that again today where the government's beginning to persecute people if they don't believe exactly, if they, if, unless they throw out their old fashioned morals and embrace this, the new government thing, then they're persecuted. That was what was happening. And so the pilgrims fled to Holland, they fled to America because they believed that your worship of God is only pleasing if it's freely given out of your conscience. And you know, that's what we believe too. We must listen to God and we must obey God and obey God only. That's the, that's the path to righteousness. That's the path to God's abundant life that we talk about all the time. I want to encourage you to get a copy of this book, The Treacherous World of the 16th Century. And, and this is the environment, this book in great detail, as you can tell by listening to, to Bill teach, is great detail of history of the environment that our forefathers had as they prepared to try to find a place to be able to worship freely. And how they heard God's voice to move to this new place and the opportunity. So this book is yours, our gift to you. That's right, our gift to you as you plant a seed into this ministry. You plant a seed and we plant a seed. Plant this into your life as you just ask the Lord for what the dollar amount is. Some can give a lot, some can give little. I just want you to have the truth. Along with the book will come a DVD. So the DVD reinforces the book or the book reinforces the DVD. Depends on how you look at it, whether you're a reader first or a listener watcher first. I would encourage you though to take this study seriously. So call the number that's on the screen or go to the website which is where it's safe and secure and get this copy for yourself as quickly as you can. Because we live in very troubled times. You know, you don't have to turn on the news to know that our, our world has lots of uh, troubles and uh, lots of uh, challenges too, just like our ancestors' world in 16th century Europe. We live in a, in a world that's in many ways being pressured by the same spirit. See, it all comes down to the spirit. That's where it's all out. The spirit of God versus the spirit of the Antichrist. Those are the two clashes that are going on. For us to be effective, we have to know the truth. We have to stand up for the truth. We have to voice the truth. We have to live the truth. And as we live the truth, our lives will change. And something's going to happen in us and around us. We call those testimonies. Here's the testimony. Times are tough. Money continues to get harder and harder to come by, and the bills continue to pile up. I don't know how much longer I'll be able to provide a roof over my family's head. I owe $32,000 on my house, and I'm in desperate need of a miracle. Even though I am severely struggling with my financial situation, I continue to give to the Lord's work each and every week. I prayed really hard that He would somehow provide a way for me to keep my house. Just a short time after, I received a letter in the mail saying that my debt had been cleared free. I can now rest easy at night, knowing that God is providing for me and my family. Thank you, Jesus. You truly are my rock and my salvation. Thankful for God's powerful hand at move. There's no problem too big. There's no issue that challenges God. He's the creator and he can recreate and he can heal and deliver with just a word, Pastor Amen. Jay. It's just the word. He did everything with a word. That's right. He started everything with the word. In the beginning was the word and one word can just change everything. And that's why I'm so glad that this word is going out to you today. So then you have an opportunity to apply God's word into your life. What I like is that God's word always changes our world. And when you look in history, you look in history, you see God's hand. It doesn't, you don't have to be a prophet. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to get a PhD in, in history to see God's hand as you look backwards through all the way, all through recorded history, you see God's hand. Bill Federer is the only man I can ever have ever met who can go through the entire history of the world <laughs> in 10 minutes. Well, I know, I was just thinking, I got, I think I got a whole class, no, a whole course yeah. on history, world history in 10, 15 minutes. I mean, things that I did not know about, 
But what impressed me the most is what you said, is like God's hand yeah. throughout the entire ages. And, and even in the ter times of persecution, oh my goodness, you wouldn't have thought how God, he used that for his purposes, you know, in the, in the later times. I, that's amazing to me. I'll tell you why it's important that you get a copy of this book for yourself and for your family. If you have children, you want to teach your children. If you have a grow, grown children, you want to share it with your children, the DVD in, in the book, because we're not being taught history. Our schools don't teach history. Very rarely is even the subject of American history brought up. It may be an elective someplace down the line of a, of a liberal arts program, but you know, we used to learn history in school. So with your best gift to this ministry, this is not just history, it's God's perspective. It's from the perspective of the spiritual. Bill's a, a godly man. He's going to teach from this program how God did what he did in, in, through the Reformation and in 16th century Europe. And it's important for us to understand that because, and with your best gift, you know how this works. You, you give a gift to the ministry, whatever that level of gift is. I'd ask you to be generous, but most of you are already. I don't need to ask you that. I thank you for that. Thank you that you're generous with Cornerstone. Thank you that you've been given uh, to this many for a long, long time. We'll give you both the book and the DVD. We'll rush it right out to you. We'll take care of the shipping and the handling. And let me tell you guys why that's an important thing. Because as we, as we connect the dots of God through history, mm -hmm. we can look backwards to look forward. Because God is on a time, a continual time. His calendar is in the past and it's in the future. So what he did in the past, he did for purposes of the future. And you know what the end is? him setting up his kingdom on earth. Mm -hmm. That's the end, back to the garden. Amen. That's where we're going. We're going back to the garden and God's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth and we're gonna live in here. This is man's journey from the garden to the garden. That's what really history is. Mm -hmm. The new garden's not gonna be like the old garden. So don't get your mind all wacky about living in, you know, and being naked and living <laughs> in the woods. That's not what that, but the new garden is gonna be a, a new heaven and an earth in relationship to God. And I, I just want us to understand that unless we know where we came from, we can't understand where we're going to go to. Yeah. You follow me? I do. And as a matter of fact, you know, I think also something that he mentions that now we have the LGBTQ That's and all of that going on ask. and that yeah. because we don't know where we came from, then anybody right. can point where it is that we're going. So you That's feel, right. do y'all feel like he was talking about what deconstruction yeah. is taking yeah. place yeah. in the classroom? Yeah. Do you think that that's happening no, in our yes. classrooms today? It's a strategy. It's not just happening, it's strategically not happening. Enough. Islam is strategically taking over our educational systems. That's, it's their strategy is to put chairs in universities and then to influence the thought pattern and to deconstruct our history. Because if our, if our young people don't know where we came, that we came from a godly heritage, they're not gonna defend it. They're not gonna defend it. I, my family came to this country in 1630. Well, it was 1632 is when he came. But he came here as a Puritan. William Kelsey came from England, brought his wife, pregnant wife, and two children, and became an indentured servant because his church was under the persecution of the Church of England. And they had to flee, and the pastor fled to Holland, and they were doing what uh, Bill described. They were persecuting uh, Christians that were outside the Church of England. They, they were torturing them. They cut off parts of their bodies. They would put them in those star chambers and interrogate them. So that whole church, that whole church, picked up and moved to the new land. And so my, my, my great, 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 great grandfather did that and brought his family. And he had to come as, a, as a, an indentured servant. He didn't have money to come. He was a, just a working guy. And so he had to sell his services for two years to pay for the, for, wow. to pay for the uh, transportation for his family. So this means a lot to me. And a lot of you share that same story. A lot of you who have heritage that came here from other places, it may not have been from England, it might have been from Europe, it may have been from Africa, it may have been from, from Asia, but came here because they were persecuted or in some way they were under duress. I, I just want to tell you that this is important for us to understand. So won't you call us, make that contribution to the ministry, call 888-665-4483. We're going to get both the book and the DVD to you, and you'll learn how your life matters because of what God's done in our nation and how we can defend the United States. Mm -hmm. How we can say, hey, 
God put this nation together for his purposes and he is at work. Well, it's so convicting because it reminds us how important history is and how important a legacy is and that we need, we're compelled to share that with future generations. Without them knowing the truth, right. they can't really defend the truth. That's right. Well, you know, I think a lot of uh, we need to make sure that we're teaching the history even of the Bible and of the Word of God to our children. You know, we're learning so many things that they're learning about in schools and all. I think about just with even my sons, I want to make sure they know the Word. So don't, you know, people worry about taking Bible out of school and things like that. Don't take it out of your home. Make sure mm -hmm. they know why they believe what they believe and that it's one man and one woman, you know, that the right. blood of Jesus has not lost its power oh, because yeah. otherwise we lose our next generation, as you just said. Because do. you can be convinced it's logical because you want everybody to be happy. Exactly. That love can come in all kinds of different forms. But the Bible tells us what love is. That's right. You know, you can be convinced that it's your choice to decide what your gender is. Right. Oh, right. I don't feel like I'm a man. I'm now going to choose to be a woman. Well, but I don't have that choice. I have a genetic pre disposition mm -hmm. to be a man because that's how I'm created. You're created that way. So when we start taking truth off the table, then we have nothing left. So this is a teaching that helps us understand where we came from so we can know where we're going to. God is gracious. And the last thing I'm going to put in this is God's, his, his, his line goes way back to Adam and Eve. And it goes way forward to what the end is. God isn't in time. Please understand that. God isn't in time. That's right. There's no constraint to time or space or distance. God is yesterday, today, and forever. We can't understand that. I can't understand that. I'll be honest with you. But he, he, he transforms and, and, and spans all of it. So what happened in the garden is still real time for him. Mm. Right. You see, God, we, we don't try to understand because we can't. <laughs> we can. But he is beyond time. He's beyond right. distance. He's right here and he's everywhere. That's our God. That's who loves you. That's who cares so much about you that he gave his son for you that you could have a relationship with him. If you haven't received Jesus as your savior, call us at 888-665-4483. And let's pray together to start life fresh and new. It's not too late. Speaking of praying, Pastor Jay, will you pray for those who's called in? Amen. Father, thank you today for every request here. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Yes, we God. thank you for the yoke destroying, burden removing anointing, Father. Yes, God. And so Lord, we speak over every request, Father, yes, the God. blessing of God. Yes, God. We declare them to be blessed in their homes. We declare yes, them to God. be blessed in their minds, yes, in their God. families, in their finances. Lord, even in their minds to comprehend your word and to comprehend history that we might propel forward into the destiny that you have for it. Yes, so Lord, we just pray your blessing upon every single person. And Lord, every person that's tuning in, may they not leave this show the same way they came. Yes, God. In Jesus' name Jesus we pray. Name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You're special to God. You know, He has created in you something that He's not created in anybody else. You're unique. He loves you so much that He made you unique. He has a special call on your life. Amen. He has a place for you to go. He has, he has an experience with him that no one else can have. We join us every day on Real Life as we explore that path. And we'll see you tomorrow on Real Life. Stone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.